Hi you guys and welcome back to another one of my videos. If you're new here, my name is Holly and thank you so so much for watching. Today marks a very exciting day for me because today is the first day of spring. It is the 1st of September today when I'm currently filming and it is also the first day that I felt like it is warm enough to not wear a jumper. So I am literally so happy about that. I don't know about you guys, but the warm breeze literally revives my soul. But anyways, I'm getting so distracted. Today I wanted to do the case of Matthew Dunbar. This case is so sad and I know I say that for every case, but I truly do believe that every case, when I research them, they're just so sad. I also wanted to quickly make a disclaimer that this case involves domestic violence. And so if that is something that is triggering to you, then I would suggest clicking off this case now. I've done other cases before that don't involve domestic violence and so you know you're welcome to watch those ones if you want to instead. Otherwise hopefully I will just see you in my next video which is going to be on Sunday. So Matthew Dunbar was born on the 3rd of November in 1974 within Australia. There really wasn't that much information I could find on Matthew and his upbringing but I did find that he was a very loyal hardworking, trustworthy, kind person. He was just very genuine. He wasn't overly outspoken either, but he was really trusted by a lot of people. He was the child of farmers and he grew up on a property sheep farm. His parents had run a sheep farm called Pandora, which was a 479 hectare property located in the small town of Woucher. Woucher is a tiny country town in New South Wales, Australia, and it's located about halfway between Armadale and Tamworth, which are two bigger regional towns. Woucher is a five hour drive from Sydney and it's surrounded by national parks and farms. It's really, really rural out there. Sadly, in around 2007, Matthew's father actually passed away and that meant that the farm Pandora was given to Matthew to start running and when he started running it, he became the third generation owner of that farm. He put a lot of effort into the farm. He restored the homestead um, of the farm and he also just did like a lot of stuff around the place to just basically just make the farm in a better condition. His father hadn't left it in the bed of conditions and so yeah he just put a lot of effort into sort of revamping the place. He really loved and cared about that farm so much. I mean Matthew had never married, settled down, he'd never had kids so he really just spent his time focusing on the farm. <laughs> How many times can I say farm? I'm so sorry guys. But it literally was his baby. He loved that place. It was his pride and joy and he really also just cared so much about his workers. He went above and beyond for the shearers and the shed hands. He was known to wash their clothes and make sure they were like nice and ready for the next morning for their work. Matthew had always felt that although he had the farm, he really just wanted someone to share it with. He'd always wanted a family, he'd always wanted, you know, a partner and he just never really found the right person. This was until the end of 2014. Matthew had been on some dating apps and he came across a lady by the name of Natasha Darcy. Matthew's friends recall at the time that he was just so happy about finding Natasha because she seemed to just sort of chase him down and he'd always felt like he was the one putting in that extra effort in relationships and really trying to make them work. So it was just so refreshing to have someone who seemed just so keen on him and seemed so willing to put in the effort and meet up with him and message him and whatnot and so he was so just happy. Natasha was a single mother of three and to Matthew this was honestly just a bonus. Like I said before he had always wanted kids so the fact that Natasha had these three beautiful children he was just so happy about it. Natasha had a girl and two young boys and at the time that Matthew and Natasha met these three kids were in primary school. I was able to find photos of them on Natasha's Facebook page but I didn't want to include any photos of the children because there aren't any photos of the kids in news articles or anything and they're still all under the age of 18 or at least the two younger ones are and 
I don't know, I just don't want to include them in this story. I want to respect their privacy. But Matthew thought Natasha was everything he ever wanted. She was smart, funny, a very dedicated mother and a very dedicated partner too. She seemed super keen to move into Matthew's place, which worked really well for him because like I said, he had that farm and he didn't really want to leave it and move away. So it worked out perfectly that Natasha would come with her three kids and live with him. Christmas of 2014 came and went and Matthew and Natasha's relationship was only getting stronger. In early 2015, when the couple had been dating for about six months, Natasha actually mentioned a few times to Matthew that she really wanted to be put in his will. Matthew didn't seem so keen on the idea, I'm guessing because they had only really been dating for six months, but Natasha was pretty persistent with it. Phone records show that she texted him in March of 2015 saying don't forget to change your will, but for whatever reason Matthew didn't do it then and so the next month Natasha texted him again saying can you promise to do one thing for me this week? Call your solicitor to book an appointment to sort out your will. Six minutes passed from that text and Matt still hadn't replied so Natasha sent a follow-up text which said okay your silence says it all and again that month Matthew didn't put Natasha in the will but by the following month of May 2015 Matthew texted Natasha saying rang solicitor and organized will change I love you so much beautiful xo 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 there were a lot of exos in that text. Now, Natasha and Matthew's relationship wasn't all rainbows and sunshine because the thing was, Natasha had actually been married in the past to a man by the name of Colin Crossman. Now, Colin Crossman was a paramedic and from what I could tell, he was also the father of Natasha's three children. Now, Natasha's relationship with Colin hadn't been really that good at all. I think there was a lot of arguments and just conflict at the end of their relationship. And in the early hours of January 16th, 2009, Natasha had actually gotten a hammer out of her garage while Colin was sleeping and hit him in the temple of his head. Colin went to hospital for this and at hospital, Natasha stuck to the story that an intruder had come in and hit him over the head and Colin had no reason to not believe her. I mean, you would want to believe your wife, right? Thankfully, Colin was okay from this incident, but only three days later, when Colin was sleeping in his bed, Natasha had sedated him with a whole bunch of pills. Colin recalls the last thing he remembers that night was eating tacos in front of the TV. So we can only assume that Natasha had put the pills in the dinner he was eating. And he said the next thing he knew is he woke up in Tamworth Hospital. What had happened was that night, once Colin had passed out, Natasha had set the house on fire. She'd grabbed her kids and she'd run out screaming to the neighbors, my house is on fire, like hell. Thank God again, Colin was actually okay. He had woken up when the house started to burn and he managed to get out. But because of these incidences in 2012, Natasha Darcy was convicted of intentionally starting a fire at the Welcher home that she lived in with her then husband, Colin Crossman. She actually wasn't charged with assaulting her husband and I can only assume it's because there wasn't enough evidence for that part, but she did serve time in prison for the house fire. This all meant that Natasha was very much on police radar. I mean, it was a small town and and word in small towns travels so fast you guys everyone knew who she was and she had a criminal record in May of 2015 so only about six months after her and Matthew had started dating Natasha actually ended up going back to prison this time she was charged with stealing one of her ex-boyfriend's credit cards and using it and she had claimed at the time that she had stolen it because he was physically aggressive. Basically, she claimed a false assault allegation against him in an attempt to get the charges dropped, but obviously that didn't happen. And she was on parole at the time because of the assault with her ex-husband. So because of this, she, yeah, went back to prison. 
Matthew supported Natasha through all of this though. He did a lot to take care of those kids. Like I said, he loved these kids and they lived with him and so he put in a lot of energy and time and effort into making sure the kids were okay and making sure that their lives stayed as normal and consistent as they could with their mother being in prison. I was actually able to find Natasha's Facebook account which is on public and it's really interesting because she shares like a lot of quotes and memes and photos and whatnot and you can see that there is a gap from about May of 2015 to October of 2016 where she doesn't post anything and in between that she posts really really regularly so I can only assume that she was in prison for that whole time which is a pretty long time that's about a year and a half that she would have been in prison for but by the end of October Natasha was out of prison and her and Matthew's relationship wasn't going as well as it had been when they'd first gotten together over a year and a half prior I guess more like two years prior Matthew was starting to really feel like Natasha was losing interest he also felt like she had a lot of demands and could say really nasty things and just didn't really take accountability and it made him really sad you know Natasha was a person that he thought he was going to spend the rest of his life with and it just it just wasn't working out that way it really deeply upset him and he struggled with depression at times in fact in mid-June of 2017 Matthew's mental state had taken a turn for the worst and he was actually hospitalized at the Tamworth Psychiatric Unit where he stayed for a few days. Him and Natasha had had a really bad fight that day um, and Matthew had actually threatened to commit suicide over a text message. The thing was Natasha didn't reply to that text message for six hours and when she did reply she just asked him to get her bread. She said absolutely nothing about the suicide threat and I just think that is so sad. I don't care who it is, if it was an acquaintance, if it was somebody I didn't really like, if they texted me and told me that they were thinking about ending their life, I would be on that in a second. I would be texting them, calling them, you know, calling the police, getting whatever help I could to support them mentally. Natasha was obviously not like that for whatever reason and so she just said nothing. In early July, Matthew had gotten a really, really bad leg infection. In fact, it was so bad that he actually had to go to hospital for it and the doctors talked about potentially having to amputate his leg. And this also played a part in his mental state. You know, he was a farmer. He was someone who was used to being up and about and on the land and he was bedridden for days. So I think that really played a big part in his mental state. It was a really slow recovery process and Matthew had regular checkups with the hospital. The last of those checkups being on August 1st. Matthew and Natasha went to the hospital together to get an update on the leg and the doctor was actually really really happy with the progress on Matthew's leg. It seemed like it was recovering really well and the symptoms that he had had with the sore leg were all seeming to disappear as well and Matthew as I'm sure you can understand was so happy about this you know he was in such a good mood that night when he got home because things were finally starting to look up he'd been struggling with this leg for weeks now and he'd finally gotten that good news that he was really hoping for and so yeah he was just really really happy that night, Natasha made Matthew a milkshake from her Nutribullet. They watched some TV together and then Matthew said that he was tired and he wanted to go to bed. Natasha offered to stay on the couch because she knew his leg was quite irritating and she had bumped it a couple of times and so yeah, she just offered to give him some space. She said that he could take the bedroom and she would sleep on the couch. So Matthew went to bed and Natasha stayed up a little bit longer. Sadly though, this would be the last time that anyone saw Matthew alive. In the early hours of August 2nd, paramedics would find Matthew Dunbar dead in his bed. 
Initially, Matthew's death appeared as a suicide as he was found hooked up to a helium tank with a bag on his head, which I don't know if you guys know, but that will cause you to suffocate and then pass away. And this was also the story that his long-term girlfriend, Natasha Darcy, was sticking to as well. As I mentioned, it was a really small town, so one of the first paramedics on the scene was actually Colin Crossman, who was Natasha Darcy's ex-husband that she had tried to burn to death in his sleep in 2009. He just felt like something wasn't quite right, and so police started looking into this case straight away. And they started looking into the events that took place leading up to Matthew's death. Meanwhile, a funeral, which was organised by Natasha for Matthew, took place on August 17th at St. Patrick's Church in Walcher. Many of his family and friends came to pay their respects. One of Mr. Dunbar's closest friends was Walcher Grazier Lance Partridge, who spoke about his achievements and his ability to make people laugh. Lance really respected Matthew and was so shocked when he heard Matthew was gone. He just felt like it didn't really make sense because he knew Matthew well and he knew that he wasn't or at least he thought that he knew that Matthew wasn't suicidal. Natasha also spoke at the funeral saying I fell in love with him because he loved me when I couldn't even love myself. He said having the children and I in his life was the happiest that he had ever been but we are so much better for having had him in ours. Matthew's mother also spoke saying that although our relationship wasn't great I always loved him and I always will. At the time that Matthew passed away him and his mother's relationship wasn't great and I think that Natasha played a bit of a part in that. I don't know that she necessarily liked the fact that Matthew and his mother were close and so yeah they weren't actually very close by the time that Matthew passed away. While all of this was going on police became more and more suspicious of Natasha. When Matthew's toxicology report came back it stated that I'm gonna have to read this bit off my phone by the way sorry guys I just could not remember these names but it stated that ace promazine which is generally used on rams as a sedative along with temazepam, clonidine and seroquel were detected in Mr. Dunbar's blood. Police had also taken Natasha's phones, I believe she had two, and her laptop to look through and this is where things get really sus. From as early as February of 2017, police could see searches of things such as is there a poison that can kill someone but be untraceable in an autopsy? Dozens of searches were also about suicide and various drugs as well. There was also a search around oxycodone murder. There was murder by inducing heart attack. There was murder by stroke, murder by injection, ace promazine murder. There was lethal dose of oxycodone 200 pound male and simply how to commit murder. On top of this, Natasha had also searched can police see websites that you've visited from your mobile and Natasha, if you're watching, yes, yes they can. This wasn't even all the searches that Natasha made. She made way more than this, but these were the searches that I saw mentioned in quite a few news articles, so they were the ones I thought I would mention. But this RAM sedative, Ace Promazine, isn't able to be obtained easily, and I'm guessing that is because of the nature of what it does. It's a sedative, and you don't want to be giving out large quantities of that to every person that you see especially at the amount that was found within Matthew's blood. And because of this, and also the specific searches about this drug that had come from Natasha's laptop, police decided to look into where the ace promazine that they had 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 come from. Police found through phone records that Natasha had rung a few vets to actually ask for this. The first vet that she rang was so concerned because like I said this was a small town and the vet actually knew who she was. They were so concerned that they had called the police who contacted Natasha about this and she said it had just been a big misunderstanding and this didn't really deter Natasha. She called another vet who just said no, and she called a third vet, which was located in Armadale, which is about 45 minutes away from where she was, 
and he actually gave her a 100 ml bottle of the stuff on the 28th of July 2017. And I don't know if you guys remember, but a few days after this is when Matthew randomly got that leg infection that also knocked him out for two days. And on top of this, that milkshake that Natasha made Matthew on the night of August 1st, well, that cup was tested and remnants of Ace Promazine were found on that cup. So things weren't looking good. And also the helium tank that Matthew had been found connected to. Police found out that Natasha and Matthew had picked up that helium tank that day on August 1st. And phone records show that Natasha had called prior to picking it up to make the order. So police were putting two and two together. And by mid-November 2017, Natasha would be arrested for the murder of Matthew Dunbar. Now Natasha really wasn't looking that innocent but she pleaded not guilty to the charge. She argued that Matthew's death was a suicide as he was known to be depressed. She argued that he was actually gay and he was internally tortured by his unclear sexual orientation which the Crown looked into and they found that he had had a previous relationship with a male. But Matthew had spoken about this with friends, saying that he didn't feel like he was into men after the experience. They also argued that Matthew was under a lot of pressure financially because of Natasha and her kids moving in, which was true. And his calf injury also triggered his depression, which was the reason for his suicide. And that's Natasha's words, not mine, by the way. But ultimately, the Crown's arguments were stronger. Matthew's psychiatrist, Clive Stanton, actually testified. He had been seeing Matthew regularly for a period of time before Matthew passed away. And he said that Matthew had mentioned in his sessions that he felt emotionally manipulated by Natasha. She was very controlling and in the past she'd made Matthew cut off friendships. In particular, she made him cut off one friendship with a female that Matthew had been friends with for years because she saw this lady as a threat. Natasha had accused Matthew of cheating with this lady, which wasn't true, but Natasha just didn't like this and what Natasha said went. She made Matthew cut her off. Clive also stated that Natasha actually asked Matthew once if the rafters in the shed were high enough for him to be able to hang himself from, which is just one of the many cruel comments that Natasha made to Matthew over the time that they were dating. Dr. Stanton, the psychiatrist, considered Matthew to be a vulnerable man who was being exploited by Natasha Darcy. But Dr. Stanton did not think that Matthew was suicidal at that point in time. The motive for the crime is believed to come back to the fact that Natasha was put on Matthew's will. When Matthew died, Natasha was going to inherit his property, which was worth over four and a half million dollars. And this was back in 2017, by the way, so that property would be worth even more now. This motive was pretty clear because Natasha had taken out a life insurance of $700,000 on her previous husband right before the house fire that she lit. So it really just seemed like sadly history was repeating itself. Natasha didn't have a job or any form of income, so I can see why the four and a half million dollars would have really appealed to her. I'm not in any way justifying what she did at all, but I think people like her sometimes just see money signs and doesn't matter what's in the way of her getting to that money, if she thinks that she can get to it, she will. Because the case against Natasha Dunbar was so strong, it only took the jury four days of deliberation to deliver their unanimous guilty verdict. She will return to court on October 1st for her sentencing hearing. And I know I will be keeping up to see how long she is sentenced to prison for. I really, really, really hope she's in there for the rest of her life because in my opinion, that is what she absolutely deserves. This case just honestly really, really hit me in the feels when I was researching it. I think, I think it just comes down to the fact that Matthew just seemed like someone who really just wanted to love and be loved. And he, you know, was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And Natasha just absolutely took advantage of him. And it's just so sad, you know? I really just wanted to make a note here of the 
importance of being able to have conversations around domestic violence. I think that if you ever feel like, you know, someone you know is in a, an unsafe situation, it's so important to just speak up about it and let them know that you are there for them and they have that person who will support them. I think that it is so much better to be a little bit over wary um, and have that uncomfortable conversation than not have it at all and potentially have this situation happen. Let me know if there's anything that I missed out. I worry sometimes that like the case makes sense in my head, but I miss important bits of information. So yeah, just let me know below if you have any questions or whatnot about the case. Also, I wanted to say that my little scrunchie is from my friend's business, which I will link down in the box below. If any of you guys are interested, she sells heaps of other stuff too. So feel free to check her out. Thank you so, so much for watching. It really means so much to me. And I really hope you are having a good day wherever you are. Bye, you guys.